Hello, political geographers. It's Dr. Divine here. Let me see if I can get a little bit better light going on here. Um, so today's lecture is about overpopulation, the discourse of overpopulation. Uh, let's jump into it. Okay. So here's your lecture slides for the day. And uh, here we are, week 13. The title of today's lecture is Malthus and the Population Bomb. If we were in class, hi Kylie, welcome to class. Uh, if we were live in class, I would ask you, how many of you think that overpopulation is an environmental problem? I'm not going to put Kylie on the spot since she's the only person here. I think Dana is going to be joining us here in a minute. But uh, generally, when I ask that question, um, most folks raise their hands. And what's interesting about that is that uh, what we're getting at here is that a very powerful discourse in our society. And remember that a discourse is all of the ways of talking about and representing a phenomenon, right? And, and it recognizes that discourses differentiate the truth from ideology. And that um, discourses um, entail powerful relations in the sense that knowledge produces, that power circulates through knowledge production that knowledge is power, as Foucault would say, if I had my little Foucault finger puppet. Um, okay, so we're, we're talking about um, the, the discourse of overpopulation. And indeed, like the discourse of development, one of the most powerful um, discourses that we talk about in our class is this um, discourse of of overpopulation. So that's where we're headed today. I think you can all see my PowerPoint slide here. Um, okay, so uh, we're talking about uh, the discourse of overpopulation. But before we do that, I want to review just really briefly some of the key ideas from last week's lecture. One of the questions that you will most likely get on your final exam is um, based on William Cronin's reading, What is the Trouble with Wilderness? And um, Bill Cronin argues that there are several answers to this question, okay? Uh, first and foremost, let me go back here, and I actually don't see it on this slide, is that Cronin argues that um, the trouble with wilderness which is the way that many people in the United States and Western Europe define nature. Nature is understood as peopleless wilderness. Nature exists where people do not, right? Is that um, this, you know, the trouble with wilderness is that it creates this understanding of nature and culture, nature and society, humans, non-humans. Um, it creates a binary, opposition between those. And that forecloses or um, prevents more complex understandings of human environmental interactions. That is to say that um, what I want to see, yeah, here we go. This is what I want. I think I want to pin me here. Yeah, so you can see me talking while I'm doing this. Hi. Okay. So the trouble with uh, the idea of separating nature and culture is that, or nature and society, is that we're not thinking about the complex interactions between the two. Does that make sense? And when we don't think about how nature and society relate to one another, this is bad for conservation. If society suggests that conservation should take place through creating national parks where people are not allowed to live, or extract resources, that this, this is bad. Um, and uh, the idea here is that 
If you define conservation as creating peopleless wildernesses, we're not attending to all of the ways that we are abusing, mis misusing, consuming nature in our everyday lives. If you're really concerned about conservation, you don't go about setting up wilderness spaces and natural preserves. You advocate for a more sustainable uh, resource use in our everyday lives in the city. Does that make sense? I've got two folks watching. Does that make sense? Okay, so Cronin says, pristine notions of wilderness are bad for conservation. Any way of looking at nature that encourages us to believe that we are separate from nature, as wilderness, the concept of wilderness tends to do, is likely to reinforce environmentally irresponsible behavior. And we talked about the examples of waste management last week, how the company waste management, the trash company, their version of going green is having an exotic animal sanctuary in New Braunfels, which is rather than subsidizing recycling or composting um, or thinking about other ways to reduce the actual production of waste. I'm not exactly sure how zebras and gazelles in New Braunfels has anything to do with waste management, but that, that's one of the ways in which they define themselves going green. Okay. And then I also talked to you a little bit about um, my research in Guatemala with the Association of Patens Forest Communities. This is another example of the trouble with wilderness. Okay. Not only does it distract from how people in the West, people in the United States use resources in their daily lives? This model of conservation of peopleless wildernesses of national parks has been exported to the third world. Guatemala being a case in point. Here you have the Maya Biosphere Reserve where I work. Um, I think most of you know I spend half of my time as a professor doing research. A lot of that work is in Central America and in this particular reserve. And um, here in the Maya Biosphere Reserve, this is 8,000 square miles. It's about the size of the state of Delaware. And the architects of the Maya Biosphere Reserve, uh, when they built the reserve in 1990, put the most ecologically sensitive areas into the western half, the Laguna del Tigre, the Lagoon of the Tiger National Park. And uh, the areas here in the east are actually areas that are managed by community foresters, by communities that live in this area, manage their lands, sustainably extract timber resources. And what you see here in this map that displays the occurrence of fire is that the lands that are in the national parks that should be the best conserved are actually the territories that have been hit the hardest by deforestation. And the idea here is that exporting this idea of conservation as wilderness reserves, as national parks where nobody lives and nobody works, exporting this model of conservation to Guatemala is not sustainable. The Guatemalan state does not have. Um, the tools, the, the money, the resources, the boots on the ground to enforce those strict conservation laws. By contrast, allowing communities to economically benefit from the land, manage their resources, providing them an incentive for abiding by the law, enforcing the law that benefits them, uh, we see here that forest cover is intact. So this is another example of how the trouble with wilderness, this idea of conservation as creating national parks has been bad for the environment in the third world. We said in the first world, it's been bad for the environment because it allows people like me to think about conservation as happening in national parks rather than in my daily life. I hope that makes sense. Uh, here's my community. And I wanted to just tell you a little bit more about Aquafope, the Association of Patens Forest Communities. Uh, they are a grassroots development organization that pursues environmental and social justice. It was a hard-won 
uh, forest concession system. They advocated for the creation of community forest concessions. They have the legal right to manage their land for a period of 25 years at a time and then the contract is up for renewal. And they had done a ton of political organizing, creating cooperatives, creating civil societies, associations, uh, working with the government, having public demonstrations, and really, um, it's just a successful model of community-led grassroots development, the alternative to uh, neoliberal prescribed development that we have looked at in the past. Okay, so that was your uh, refresher on last week's content, The Trouble with Wilderness. I'm now excited to talk a little bit about Thomas Malthus and his essay on the principle of population. Now you might be wondering, looking at the syllabus, could I not have found anything more recent to assign in terms of prescribed readings? I'm asking you to rise to the challenge of uh, being a scholar and reading original texts by people who have published ideas like the principle of population, Thomas Malthus's argument, that have been deeply influential. So, um, you know, the, the principle of population, I asked you to read the first nine or so pages. Uh, the language is very stilted. It's, you know, but it was written in 1798 by this man. Thomas Malthus. You might not have heard his name before, but you have certainly heard the idea um, and his argument about the principle of population. So what is Malthus's um, main argument in the principle of population? What is the principle of population? I've got a couple of people here uh, live with this taping. Does anybody want to chime in? I realize you may not have been able to read yet, but. The, the question is, what is Malthus's main argument in the principle of population? He argues that um, basically, population is always going to grow at a faster rate than food production. And this equation is going to result in starvation and vice. Vice is sin, right? So he says in that text, population, when unchecked, increases at a geometric ratio and subsistence for man in an arithmetic ratio. This is another way of saying that Population is going to grow geometrically, two times two times two times two, while food production grows arithmetically, two plus two plus two plus two. So food production is always going to be outstripped by population. Population will always grow faster than the Earth's capacity to produce food. And this will lead to famine and starvation. And the outcomes are not just starvation and famine, but forms of sin, which is another way of saying vice, which include abortion, birth control, which was seen as vice, prostitution, homosexuality. So whenever we're thinking about the creation of knowledge as an exercise of power. We have to attend to the geopolitical historical factors at play at that time. So for example, earlier on in the course, um, when we were talking about Linnaeus's uh, system of nature and the varieties of men, which he published in 1760, uh, which created the modern day race categories, I asked you to think about the colonial context that produced that knowledge. It's not as if Linnaeus was in a laboratory isolated. No, he was, he was creating so-called scientific principles to explain the world. But in doing so, he was making his world point universal, right? The idea of science is that it's universal. And Malthus in a similar way, this is the period of the enlightenment, the idea that science 
um, is guided by natural laws and not by the hand of God. Remember, we talked a little bit about how the concept of nature has changed in Western societies and how with the scientific enlightenment that starts in the mid 1600s that, you know, that these, of which Linnaeus is a part, that, um, that these so-called scientists were searching for universal truths that were based in nature rather than in um, religious doctrine. So Malthus is also one of these people like Linnaeus that's producing scientific truths about how the world works. But we're arguing that their science is deeply shaped by the politics of the day. So let's think a little bit about Malthus's England, what England looked like in Malthus's day. Okay, Thomas Malthus. 1798 is when uh, the principle of population was published. And what's really critical to understand is that um, when Malthus wrote this piece, The Principle of Population, it was a period known as the enclosures. This is the birth of capitalism. This is the industrial revolution taking place in England at that time. And with capitalism came the privatization of property and the privatization of the commons in particular, right? So um, on the one hand, you need to understand that um, there was a huge transition unfolding at the time from basically feudalistic, mercantilistic economies to a capitalist economy. What did this mean? Okay, so I need to explain to you uh, just a little bit about um, what preceded capitalism, because maybe you're unfamiliar. Well, we're going to talk about, um, you need to ask this question in particular times and particular places, because the story will be different, but there are, this is a story that we're going to look at here, here in England. So um, prior to capitalism in England, uh, you had a system of basically um, landed aristocracy who owned huge feudal estates, right? They owned huge tracts of land, the aristocracy in England. And they would have poor peasants who worked their land, but it was a form of sharecropping. Does anybody know what sharecropping is who's listening along? We had that system in the US as well. Do the peasants sharecropping just kind of like tenant farming but like with a lot less benefits for the tenants themselves it's kind yeah. of just like that cycle of dependence right it's where the peasants don't own the land or the farmer doesn't own the land they they basically rent the land from the landowner and give a share of their product or money um to to the landowner right so in england the way this worked um, under feudalism is that you would have like the feudal lord <laughs> and you would have um, the peasants who are also known as the commoners and they would farm the land and live on the land and give 20% or 30%, whatever the Lord decided um, to the feudal lord is like a tax for allowing them to, to live on that land. But what's interesting is that the commoners also had access to the commons. And the commons were the areas between the feudal estates that the peasants could go and hunt, collect wood, collect water, graze their animals, right? It was common land, hence the commons, right? Owned by the commoners. It was not privatized land. And it was seen as a resource that was available to those peasants to supplement their livelihoods. Well, what happens in England during the 1700s, during the Industrial Revolution, is the period of the enclosures. And this is really important because the enclosures equals the privatization of the commons. This is experienced as a form of land dispossession by the commoners. All of a sudden, the woods, the game areas, the pastures that they would use to supplement 
their livelihoods. They could hunt, they could get meat, they could get leather, they could, you know, get fish, um, they could collect food, hunting and gathering. All, all of those resources were privatized and they didn't get any of it, okay? And um, this is a huge moment in the history of capitalism. And I'm going to draw a little bit today on um, the scholarship of uh, Karl Marx, who first and foremost is a historian of capitalism because we're in the United States and because of politics and the ways in which his ideas um, were taken forward in the USSR, most people think of Marx simply as a communist politician. But first and foremost, he was a historian of first scale. And he analyzed um, this transition in England from feudalism to capitalism. And he saw it as a very violent process, right? He saw the privatization of the commons the, through the process of the enclosures as like the first step to the birth of capitalism in England, okay? Because he says when the commoners are separated from the commons, when every single stitch of land has been privatized, people are forced onto the labor market, the capitalist labor market, where they have to earn a wage to buy the things that they used to produce for themselves. So he uses this moment, um, the privatization of the commons, the enclosures, the separation of working class people from the land. He calls this primitive accumulation, the first accumulation of capital, the birth of capitalism. Okay. And, uh, you know, Marx calls um, these different production systems, feudalism, mercantilism, capitalism, socialism, communism, these are all different modes of production. They're modes of organizing a society and an economy, right? So he talks about the capitalist mode of production versus the feudalist mode of production, all right? So he's talking about the birth of capitalism, which was very recent, right? We're talking about late 1750s. Okay, so let's see. Um, so the preconditions for the birth of capitalism refer to the creation of a population with no other means of livelihood but their labor power to be sold on the labor market, uh, which enables the people who own the factories to accumulate a lot of wealth. And um, in this concept, the adjective primitive corresponds to this moment in time in the past uh, when the commons were enclosed that becomes like a, what he's saying is that the enclosure of the commons was a precondition for capitalist takeoff because commoners were forced to go to the city to look for work to earn a wage because they no longer could support themselves from the land they once had access to okay and um, I was doing a little bit of research this morning. I couldn't find the article I wanted to in particular, but I would encourage you to do a little bit of research on your own to get a sense of what city life looked like um, in England um, at this time. So when we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, we're talking, yes, sort of 1750s to 1850s. These pictures are a little bit later, but they're very much emblematic of, of how this transition from feudalism to capitalism impacted everyday people. Basically, there was a transition from a system based on agricultural production on sort of feudal estates with the aristocracy, the lords who had their their estates and it, it, the transition from that agricultural industry to a manufacturing industrial industry, dang, it was a revolution. People moved to urban areas in droves. They, were, they had to, they were forced onto the labor market, as Marx says, because they had to now earn money to buy things that they used to be able to provide for themselves. Rather than being able to go and hunt in the forest, 
Now people had to have money to buy meat in the store, right? So this is what he's talking about in terms of um, urbanization and the Industrial Revolution. And what this meant was that um, life was really hard for people in London. There was immense poverty, immense poverty, immense squalor. Children, families living in the street, much more than they are today. And these are some images of like these poor houses that were constructed in London where people would sleep in coffins for four cents a night. And they even rented ropes where people could sleep, homeless people could sleep and uh, on a rope, if you could believe it. This is England um, in the late 1800s. What Marx is talking about is the transition from feudal peasants into the industrial proletariat. And um, the sort of labor relationship that he's looking at is the relationship between uh, the capitalist bourgeoisie who own the factories, the means of production, and the people who are wage laborers. The, what he called the proletariat. And what Marx said about capitalism as a system was that wealth was generated from the difference between what capitalists made in profit minus expenditure of materials uh, and, um, and the value of labor, right? So you pay laborers less, the capitalist makes more, you pay laborers more, the capitalist makes less, he said, this is a system of exploitation. Basically, the capitalist is making money off of the difference of what they earn versus what they pay the labor force, right? So this is sort of his theorization of how this economic system worked versus the feudalistic system that preceded it. And he documents violent labor rights abuses, children living in the street, just a really literally a crappy situation, feces in the street, just filth, dirt, coal, mass poverty. Well, all of this hardship in England creates debate in Congress. Oh, actually, I want to go back. I'm going to see if I can try something. Let's see if we can do this here. Okay, I have a little YouTube video and I don't know if we're going to be able to watch it together. So I've got a couple people watching along. If you could help me, I want to see if this will work. I'm going to try to show, I want to watch a little video clip with you. Okay. So those of you who are watching along, if you don't mind, is to prefer to use the I'm going to see if I can share this and see if it works. We're going to do a little zoom little zoom exercise here. The famous example of the Duchess of Sutherland, who on the one hand, as he says in the footnote on 892. Can you hear that? Entertained Mrs. Be Mrs. Beecher Stowe, author of, this, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin with great magnificence in London to show her sympathy for the Negro slave of the American Republic. Is that working? Yeah, it's working. Yes, it is. Okay, you can see David Harvey introduces primitive accumulation. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So let's watch this together then. Um, what, you're, what you're seeing here is um, one of today's most uh, preeminent um, geographers who is a, a historian and scholar of Karl Marx's works. And he's talking about the concept of primitive accumulation, which is, just to be extra clear, the separation of the commoners from the commons. It's the privatization of the commons, uh, the enclosures, okay? And he's talking about the violence of this process. All right. Famous example of the Duchess of Sutherland. Oh, as he sorry. says in the footnote on 892, entertained Mrs. Be Mrs. Beecher Stowe, author of this, authoress of Uncle Tom's Cabin with great magnificence in London to show her sympathy for the Negro slaves of the American Republic while expelling all of the crofters from the highlands in one of the huge highland clearances, which again, cast people away from their traditional forms of livelihood and led them either to emigrate, as many of them did, 
or to end up as proletarians in the cities. So the summary of this argument is given at the end of this chapter on 895, where he says, the spoliation of the church's property, the fraudulent alienation of the state domains, the theft of the common lands, the usurpation of feudal and planned property, and its transformation into modern private property under circumstances of ruthless terrorism. All these things were just so many idyllic methods of primitive accumulation. Okay, so primitive accumulation is the, the dissolving the feudal structures of land ownership, expelling the commoners from the commons, okay? They conquered the field for capitalist agriculture, incorporated the soil into capital. Interesting notion, the commodification of the land, the commodification of the soil actually makes the soil a medium through which capital starts to circulate and created for the urban industries the necessary supplies of free and rightless proletarians. In chapter 28, what we see is what happens to these people when they get thrown off the land. What happens is they become vagabonds, they become paupers. In some cases, they go into becoming highwaymen and robbers and all the rest of it. So what we here find is the power of the state starts to be utilized as a disciplinary apparatus on relationship, in relationship to those people who've been dispossessed. <laughs> of their livelihoods. And the story which Marx tells here is quite simply that state power is used, state powers of incarceration, of violent punishment and all the rest of it, uh, become actually standard practices. And in fact, you're saying to all of the people who've been dispossessed, you either become good proletarians or else you're going to suffer from the disciplines of this state apparatus. And along with that, you have uh, legislation over wages, so the wages can't be too high. You have legislation on the minimum length of the working day, which we've encountered earlier, as opposed to the maximum length. And we get a whole series of barbarous laws against combinations of workers, which accuse them of treasonous activity if they try to combine together to improve their lot. Okay. So what you see there um, with uh, David Harvey sort of reading uh, some of those excerpts from Capital to you is that, um, you know, what he's doing is he's describing this transition from feudalism to capitalism as a violent process and a process that was backed up by the state so that um, the state itself becomes what he calls a disciplinary apparatus for capital, that the state supposedly supposed to represent the people now serves the interest of a small group of people um who are in a position of power okay so uh if we're interested in sort of more of david harvey's interpretation of capital i would encourage you to check it out he's a, a really interesting guy to listen to all right so let's go back um to our slides here so i hope uh you know this always works a little bit better in <laughs> in person when we can talk a little bit more interactively. But what I want you to be getting here and what I want you to understand is that the concept of primitive accumulation is the birth of capitalism, the creation of the conditions for capitalism. And Marx argues that the enclosures, the privatization of peasants' lands that were known as the commons, the commoners owned the commons, uh, the mass privatization of private property, uh, of property rather, force people into urban areas to work into factories and that this massive transition from a rural to an urban based economy creates a massive poverty and the state was there to protect the interests of um, the wealthy and the few.
Okay, so let's, uh, here are some more images for those of you who just want to look at those again, of sort of what city life looked like in, not only in London, but in industrial manufacturing areas across uh, England and later Europe. Okay, so with all of this going on, <laughs> all of this transition, and you know, it was violent, people were protesting and the state would put down the people. This, and, and, and there were horrible laws protecting the owners of the factories, what, you know, what Harvey and Marx would call the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, that they, uh, that the state became basically their servant to serve their interests rather than protecting um, the needs of, of the people more broadly. And what happens uh, given all of this transition and all of these problems is that um, in 1795, by the time, you know, a hundred years of enclosures, a hundred years of transition, of chaos, of poverty in cities, and the, you know, the aristocracy having to step over the children living in squalor in the cold, and the Thames is basically a big sewage pit, right? That's, that's what London looks like in 1795, right? And this spurs the debate in Parliament um, about what to do with this massive poverty and destitution that's defining London and other cities like Manchester, Newcastle, um, uh, 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 Portsmouth, um, you name it, at large, bright, you know, these major industrial areas across England, right? It wasn't just London. And um, so there's debate in Congress, or excuse me, in Parliament at the time. And uh, what they're debating is, um, it's a debate between two parliamentarians. One is named Pitt, the other one is named Whitbread. And what they're debating is uh, reforming the Act of Settlement, okay? So the Act of Settlement was passed in 1662 and it was actually a piece of feudal legislation. It was a piece of law that govern the relationship between people, land, resources, right? And this was the previous system. It was a system of labor immobility. People could not move freely in the feudal mode of production, in the feudal economic system, okay? If you were born to a particular Lord's estate, you were tied to that estate through this law, the act of settlement, settling in place. People were born to the feudal, not people, commoners, peasants, the majority of people, not the aristocracy, right? But the peasantry, the farmers, the commoners, you were born to a feudal estate, you were tied to that feudal estate, and the church was the manager, arbiter of taking care of the poor, managing death records, marriage records, and, um, Basically, people were born to an estate, they were tied to an estate. It was like a system in which people were indebted to the Lord, but the Lord and the parish worked together to ensure some basic social safety net. That was the deal. But it meant that in the context of the Industrial Revolution, people couldn't easily leave where they had been born to move to Manchester, to move to Newcastle, to move to um, Portsmouth, to, uh, to, to fuel the labor needs of the Industrial Revolution. So there was a debate in Parliament about overhauling this act of settlement to create a labor system that would meet the needs of the Industrial Revolution. But because the act of settlement had this social safety net built into it in 1662, there was debate, well, if we free labor, who's going to guarantee their right to exist, their basic needs? And here emerges the debate between Pitt and Whitbread. Pitt wanted to abolish the settlement law of 1662 to free labor mobility, but to offer no social safety net to these commoners turned proletariat. You following me, Alex, are you following me? 
right? This yes, is ma'am, I am following you. <laughs> like this is big, right? We're talking about the transition from feudal peasants and commoners to proletariat labor, right? So like the very category of the worker changes as the system of production changes. Now pits like screw them, right? They move to the city, we're not providing, you know, no, you, no. Whitbread, on the other hand, argues the opposite. He says, he's actually, I think, quite empathetic with um, the poverty that he probably sees in London and other major cities around England. And he probably, I think there probably were members of um, parliament that uh, were concerned with, with the poverty of the masses. And he's advocating for um, the UK to create a social safety net for these new urban proletariat. What we have here, folks, really interestingly, is the first debate about a welfare system in, the, in, in capitalism, is this Pitt and Whitbread debate in England in 1795 over the repeal of the Act of Settlement and what social safety net should come in its place. Well, and the way that I remember it, people is like Pitt, he's a Pitt, Whitbread, he's advocating for the people. He wants the people to have bread, right? Pitt and Whitbread. Pitt, no social safety net. Whitbread, provide them a social safety net. Well, um, the, the, uh, the result is that Whitbread wins. And not only is the act of settlement repealed, but the 1796 Spenumland, the English have a funny way, <coughs> pronouncing Spenumland, Spenumland laws, or you can call them the poor laws of 1796 are enacted. So Whitbread wins the debate. But before you go on thinking that, wow, he was such a progressive guy and pro-poor, I also want you to understand uh, the context that motivated him to want to alleviate the suffering of uh, many people in urban areas. So 1796, yes, the poor laws, the first poor laws, the first welfare system is created in England. And, but you have to understand when they were passed, there was a shortage of wheat due to some bad harvests, okay, nature. Number two, the French Revolution is happening, people. Okay, so England is cut off from importing wheat from continental Europe because France was one of the main conduits for imports from everywhere, right? But French wheat, um, other sources of wheat are cut off due to what's unfolding in France, the French Revolution. And indeed, the French Revolution is weighing really heavily on the minds of the wealthy, uh, the descendants of the aristocracy in England at this time. Remember what happened to the aristocracy in France. So they want to appeal the poor and alleviate their suffering to make sure that they literally keep their own heads, right, to some degree. Uh, so uh, ask your dad. Just hold on for a second. And indeed, there had been some uh, food riots in um, England at that time. Okay, so maybe Whitbread was um, a pro-poor guy. Maybe he just wanted to prevent uh, a revolution from unfolding in England like it had in France. Uh, and so uh, Whitbread is successful in this debate. The poor laws are passed and basically it meant that people could get relief based on a calculation of the cost of bread, which we knew at this point was really high, uh, but that would fluctuate and the number of children that a man had, right? Because the man was assumed to be the head of household. Uh, a laborer would have his income supplemented to a subsistence level. <clears throat> so basically what the poor laws did of 1796 was provided a minimum wage as to subsistence. Now, I really wanna hear one of you who are listening, if you had, so do you know anything about parliament? There's two houses, right? What are the two houses of parliament in England? The House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Commons and the House of Lords. Do you think that has anything to do with this feudal history? 
I'm yeah. going to assume so. Yes, those very terms are reflective of this history that we're getting at today. And if you had to guess, okay, so what's the difference between the House of Commons and the House of Lords? It's still a bicameral legislature, but so the House of Lords is kind of like our Senate, and then the House of Commons is like our House of Representatives. And I'm not sure I should know the answer to this question. Maybe one of you do. Um, the House of Lords, is that an, inher an inherited position or an elected position? I believe it's elected. Okay. Certainly, uh, the way that we think about this historically was that uh, Parliament, and I don't know if I'd have to do some digging, maybe one of you could dig, that the House of Lords was sort of um, positions that were granted through inheritance, um, meaning that, you know, if you're a member of the aristocracy, you would be in the House of Lords, and then the House of Commons was the House of the Commoners, sort of an elected, more populist position. If you had to guess, Thomas Malthus, who's going to, who writes the principle of population, is he in the House of Lords or the House of Commons? Is he an aristocrat or is he a commoner? I would hope that he's a commoner. No, he's an aristocrat. <laughs> so he's in the House of Lords. He's in the House of Lords. Does aristocrat mean um, like the elite population? Exactly. Is that Those were the people who own the feudal estates and okay. would inherit property, right? Being passed on um, through their through their families. And you know what's happening is that you know Malthus is is a member of the of Parliament and the House of Lords at this time, and he supports Pitt. He does not think that there should be any social safety net. And uh, first of all, he doesn't like this because this represents a form of taxation for wealthy people like himself, right? Um, and so Malthus is watching this debate unfold. He's um, understanding that this welfare policy, the poor laws of 1796, are going to come out of taxation. And of course, it'll be the aristocracy. They're, they're the only people who have money to be taxed. And uh, so he was arguing actually against the poor laws. But rather than coming clean about his political position, he relies on science. He makes a, a so-called scientific argument to write the principle of population, to argue that uh, the poor laws um, are only going to encourage people to have more children. And because of the principle of population, this just means ultimately that more people are gonna starve later on. So he comes up with this principle of population in 1798. It took him a hot minute to, to write it, maybe a year to get it published. And he's writing this as a response to the social context and the welfare debates that are unfolding in England. He writes the principle of population to say there is science behind the argument that we should not provide welfare to the poor. Because if you provide welfare to the poor, they're just going to have more kids. And therefore, given the principle of population, population always increases faster than food production, they're going to have starvation, murder, vice, etc. So Malthus's arguments about the principle population, that overpopulation is a problem, that overpopulation creates poverty, and misery, does this sound familiar to anybody? You've heard this before, tell me. When, when I, if I was to ask you, is overpopulation a problem, who would raise their hand and say yes? I would. Most everybody would. But your belief that overpopulation is a problem comes from Malthus's arguments in the principle of population. I want you to challenge your thinking about overpopulation as being a problem, right? So today we're going to um, wrap up thinking about just Malthus's piece, Malthus's arguments about the principle of population. And on Wednesday, we're going to delve a little bit more into the population bomb. 
and, uh, and other Malthusian legacies. Okay, maybe we'll do a little bit of that today, but we'll see here. Okay, so when we talk about Malthus's legacies, um, again, the principle of population is the argument that it is science, scientifically proven, that food production will always be outstripped by population growth. And therefore, the idea, you know, he argues that overpopulation creates famine and misery in London cities, not capitalism, not the privatization of property. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Malthus is arguing and using science to argue that the poverty that he witnessed in England was not the result of the transition to capitalism, was not the result of the enclosures of the commons, that it was the result of a scientific principle. Yes, Alex. That honestly sounds a lot like the argument for eugenics and all of these other things that are just like, this is like an inherent thing that is like within this subset of the population and we must do our best to get rid of it. Yeah, exactly. And you'll read on Wednesday in the Ross article, he goes through four or five of these legacies of Malthus and eugenics is one of them. The idea that the poor are breeding too quickly. They can't control their sexual urges. If you read Malthus's first nine pages, you would have got um, a little bit of taste of that. You know, he's blaming the poor for their poverty, their inability to control their own reproduction. And of course, that puts him, you know, off the hook. Because if it's just the, if it's the principle of population that creates famine, well then what place does welfare reform have? Welfare, and this is, you know, what Malthus says, that, that basically, um, here we go. I'm gonna come back to those legacies in a minute here. But what you need to understand is that what Malthus is doing here, he's not identifying scientific principles. He's using and abusing science to pursue his political goals. Number one, he's defending private property. Clearly, the privatization of the commons was a violent and difficult experience for working class. Well, it wasn't, they would recently become working class. They were feudal peasants. They became the working class under capitalist mode of production. What he's doing is he's defending the privatization of the commons, defending private property, defending the fact that poor people now had no access to land whatsoever. In fact, not only do they not have access to land, they have to rent the very house that they live in, right? He's trying to naturalize the difference between rich and poor. And this term naturalization is really important. He's rendering biological and scientific rather than social, the differences between rich and poor. So that the poor are not poor because of the harsh policies of the privatization of land, poor working conditions, lack of welfare. Uh, that wasn't the cause of their poverty. The cause of their poverty was their lack of sexual restraint, their inability to control their reproduction, and uh, the principle of population, right? So he was basically saying that the wealthy were in a better position to manage resources, the poor were just like rabbits. And first and foremost, um, Malthus's principle of population is an anti-welfare argument. He argues that redistributing wealth would cause further increase in the population. If you don't let the few die off now, they're going to have more kids, and so more people will die in the future. I know it seems hard to believe. This is his argument. Check it out from page 24. To remedy the frequent, to remedy the frequent distresses of the common people, the poor laws of England have been instituted. This is from the principle of population that you read. Not this section, but later on. But it is to be feared that though they may have alleviated a little the intensity of individual misfortune, they have spread the general evil over a much larger surface, right? So Whitbread and his supporters in the House of Commons, 
who advocated for welfare for the commoners termed proletariat. They were just spreading the evil and the inevitable over a much larger population in the future. So we'll be talking about um, how these ideas of the poor breeding like rabbits, they just need to die off, how this does inform eugenics. And you must, 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 must read that Ross article. And in fact, I moved the quiz to Wednesday because I wanted you to read that in particular. Um, but one of the more immediate um, legacies of Malthus was that the, the poor laws of 1796 were overturned. And in 1834, um, a so-called new poor law was passed after the Spenumum laws, the first poor laws were repealed, that forced the destitute, the poor, to seek relief in workhouses modeled after prison. Basically, being poor, a pauper was criminalized. And if people were on the streets, um, they were put into workhouses, which were basically like prisons. They had to work for free to have um, a bed or something to eat. Uh, the Irish potato famine. Has anybody heard about the Irish potato famine? Yeah, but I don't know a whole lot about it. Like, I think I learned about it in high school, but I, it was very, barely touched on. That's how my dad's family came over here. Mine as well. So what do you know about the potato famine and its causes? Wasn't it just like back, there was like something wrong with the potatoes and like they kept on like getting, I think, what was it? Wasn't it like bacteria or something that was like getting into the potatoes and it was making people sick and die. And so then people wouldn't be able to eat the potatoes, but potatoes were like the main source of food. So really the Irish are just SOL. Right. I thought it but, was a drought period also, or I don't know, I might be wrong. Yeah, it was uh, first and foremost, um, a blight, a fungus that killed, uh, whew, wiped out the vast majority of the potato crop in Ireland. Now, why was Ireland in 1845 so dependent on one crop? Why would, why would the blight of one crop versus all of the diversity of foods that one could eat, why would that result in the death of a million people and the emigration of how many millions more to America and elsewhere? Import substitution? It has to do with imports and exports. But why was the majority of the English countryside under the production of potatoes at the time? <clears throat> you didn't read about that. I'm just I'm wondering if you know, because I'm tired of talking. <laughs> it was colonial policy. Ireland was a colony of England at the time, right? And basically to fuel the Industrial Revolution, all of those lands that were privatized were put into the production of an export crop, potatoes. Potatoes were easy to grow, high in calories, they could last a long time. When you have everybody working in the factories rather than producing food for themselves, you still gotta produce food, right? And England basically turned Ireland into a potato plantation to fuel the Industrial Revolution. England, like elsewhere, went from an agricultural system that was based on producing many, many different types of crops to all of the land being privatized, commoners being put into cities and people, all of that land being put into potato production. So it was only because of the Industrial Revolution, the privatization of land in Ireland and how Ireland became a food, a food source, a fuel source for the Industrial Revolution did the, the blight affect so many people. And the Malthusian legacy here, folks, is that at the same time that millions in Ireland were dying of famine, potatoes were still being exported to England. And um, colonial officials use the principle of population 
to support this policy. And this is the same darn thing that happened in India <clears throat> a couple of decades later, where Malthus's arguments of the principle of population are used to justify uh, the continued exportation of rice and other basic grains from India to England, while tens of millions of Indians were dying of famine because their famine was a result of overpopulation, not bad British colonial policy, right? Mike Davis is the most amazing geographer of all time. Maybe not. He's one of the best, one of the greatest. And he writes about this in the late Victorian Holocaust and details this violent process and precisely how this idea of work camps were used um, and so we have to we have to understand these two famines as part of Malthus's legacy because the principle of population was used to justify not alleviating the famine and starvation of the Irish and the Indians as colonial subjects um, in the British Empire. Okay, so that's some pretty intense stuff, but Alex. Question. I was, I was just gonna say, like all of the, all of that you were talking about, like how the Irish and the Indians were supposed to just keep on exporting everything, even while they were undergoing famine. That sounds a lot like United Fruit Company in Guatemala, or maybe even like oil in Mexico, or just all of these things that you're talking about. So it's really just like a cycle of capitalism <laughs> repeating itself throughout history and the same tactics are being used and the same people are getting hurt and we still haven't learned our lesson, I guess. You know, um, I'm, uh, I want to mention something about Guatemala now that you've done it, uh, now that you've brought Guatemala up. Um, I, don't, I don't know that if you've seen Granito yet, but if you've seen Granito, um, the, the documentary- It made me cry. That, oh, isn't it powerful? It made me cry. And so like, I just went to dinner and my family's just like, Alex, why are you crying? And I'm just like, I just watched a documentary about like the mass murdering government corruption of Guatemala and I really can't focus right now. I know. That was fun. Good conversations. Yeah. There's, so there's a, there's a moment at the beginning when um, it's introducing Rigoberta Menchu. Mm -hmm. And if you remember when she says, she says, um, I think that I either had you watch part of this video or I know that you watched it either. It was from When the Mountains Tremble, which of course that relates to Granito. But Rigoberta as a young woman is explaining that her family had such little land that it wasn't enough to produce for themselves. So each summer they had to go to the Southern coast to work in the plantations. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Okay, and her two brothers died yeah. Working in the plantations, uh, one because of the terrible conditions, one died of malnutrition, and yeah. the maldito patron fired them for you know missing work for the funeral and didn't pay them for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's okay. That's part of the story of primitive accumulation. What happened with indigenous people in the Americas and taking Guatemala as an example, dispossessing people of their lands forces them onto the wage labor market. If you're a subsistence farmer, like the indigenous Maya are, you don't have to earn a wage. If you have access to the forest, if you have access to land, you can produce for yourself access to water, right? These are non-capitalist economies that many Mayans are still participating in today. It's not a wage-based economy, right? But to force indigenous people to work in industrial export capitalism, you had to take away their land because if they have access to land, they can, they can survive outside of that economic system. So she says, we had so little land that we couldn't produce enough food for ourselves. We had to go to the Costa Sur. We had to go to the Southern coast. And uh, for me, that's, that epitomizes how one, this idea of primitive accumulation Separating people from the land is a precondition to creating a wage labor force. It's ongoing today. And um, while in England, land's been private, you know, there's not many subsistence farmers in England. 
but there are indigenous people across the Americas and across the world who still imagine other ways of living outside of capitalism and uh, having access to their lands is the precondition that enables them to do this, right? So primitive accumulation, the enclosure of the land, the privatization of poverty as a precondition for capitalist development, we still see it unfolding around the world today in really profound ways. Um, so we're gonna come back. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? You know, we talked a little bit at the beginning about um, community forestry, right? When I was talking about um, the trouble with wilderness. Now, uh, when I talk about community forestry and I'm talking about the, you know, the communities that I've worked with in Northern Guatemala, um, is that an example of capitalist development? I wouldn't yeah. think so. It is? It is in so, in so many ways because they are selling the product, they're paying wage labor, but what's unique is that their, their lands are collectively owned and managed, right? So that rather than one person owning those, you know, 100,000 acres of land, it's owned by a community. So the benefits are distributed, but it's very much part of the global capitalist economy. So I'm not advocating for um, a communist or a socialist revolution or an overthrow of the capitalist mode of production. I'm wanting you to understand its origins. And I'm also flagging that there's a lot of gray, right? And how we go about uh, designing economies, designing livelihoods. And I want to continually point to the success stories of what could work under this current system that is having success. So going back to Guatemala, we see both the worst of what can happen in Rigoberta's experience and also alternatives with community foresters doing amazing things, building schools, paying for uh, clinics, um, transforming conservation practices around the world. Okay, so not all is lost, all right? Um, but again, just another sort of um, lesson and another iteration of how science is often used to pursue political ends. On Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the population bomb as one of the legacies of Malthus's thinking. Um, and I'm also going to pose a question to you, right? If we no longer take for granted that overpopulation causes famine and environmental degradation. If overpopulation is not the problem, then what is? Is there enough food to feed the world? Plenty. Yes. Definitely. So why are people still hungry? Because of the distribution. <laughs> because of distribution, right? What happens when we start defining the problem in terms of the distribution of resources rather than overpopulation, what other, what alternative solutions might we identify to famine and to environmental contamination? All right, so we'll pick back up on Wednesday from there. Hope you're all doing great. Go outside and enjoy some beautiful weather. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.